Hey class, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry about that. It's uh, good to be with you all again. I uh, hope you are doing well. Uh, we're gearing up for the end of the semester. I cannot believe it already that that time is here, uh, but it is drawing upon us. This is our uh, second to last lecture. This is a uh, lecture for week nine. Uh, next week we'll have our um, last lecture, and then the week after that will be finals. Uh, so really excited about uh, digging into um, uh, some more of the ecumenical councils uh, today. And, and so, broadly speaking, there are seven ecumenical councils that um, the three main branches of the church agree on. Uh, when I say three main branches, I refer to the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and then Protestants. Uh, collectively, in general, we agree on the decisions that were made at these seven ecumenical councils. Uh, and so today we're going to look at the fifth, sixth, and seventh ecumenical council, look at what they discussed, um, look at what was approved, rejected, denied, and uh, so on. Uh, just by way of reminder, uh, the first ecumenical council is was the first council of Nicaea. Uh, that was in 325, and that... Um, affirmed uh, Jesus uh, being equal to the Father. Uh, the second ecumenical council uh, was the first council of Constantinople in 381. Um, the third ecumenical council is the council of Ephesus 431. Uh, there in Ephesus, um, they decided that Mary was the mother of God, um, and they affirmed that there was just one person uh, in Jesus. And so, uh, that's when they went against uh, Nestorianism. So uh, the fourth ecumenical council then was the Council of Chalcedon in 451. And there that's where they uh, affirmed two distinct natures in Jesus. So one person, two natures. Um, and that they were held together um, without confusion, change, division, or separation. And so... Uh, that was the fourth ecumenical council. That was the Council of Chalcedon 451. And so uh, if you remember me saying there are different groups, uh, different factions, if you will, within the church kind of based on uh, where you live. And, and that's natural and that's normal. Uh, we kind of had the uh, Antiochian group and the Alexandrian group uh, that ultimately were not really happy at what was done at Chalcedon. And so uh, we're going to pick up there. Uh, remember, um, you know, the empire is huge. The West is into Latin now. East is still uh, you know, Greek. And so two, you know, again, kind of different cultures going on within the empire, affecting different parts of the church differently. Um, so last week we, we jumped into the West and explored some of the in invaders and some of the developments there that led to uh, the church uh, rising up to kind of a political status, uh, a means of uh, stability uh, for the western part of the empire. And so today, we're going to pick things back up in the eastern part of the empire. And so, after the Council of Chalcedon in 451, uh, people were still upset with the decision that was made. Um, that uh, they, they just didn't agree with it. They didn't like it. You know, because again, it wasn't just a few people here and there. You know, there were two main groups, Antiochian um, and Alexandrian. And so uh, some saw uh, Dioscorsus uh, as a martyr for being outstit for his views. And remember, Dioscorsus supported Eudaches, um, who did not maintain the distinction between the two natures. Uh, and so they kind of viewed Dioscorsus as uh, this martyr, because he was outstripped for his views. And so, um, you know, the, the eastern part of the empire had that going on. Um, coupled with that uh, was objections in general uh, to the government uh, because they didn't feel like the benefits that they got uh, were proportional to the amount that they were being taxed. So they felt like they were being taxed too much um, and not getting enough benefits from the government, um, you know, for their taxes. And then, of course, there were, you know, the cultural and ethnic tensions existing. You know, people in the area, in the eastern part of the empire, uh, still hadn't really gotten over the fact that they were under Roman rule. 
And so there's lots of things going on in the eastern part of the empire as well after the Council of Chalcedon. And the emperors tried to create unity uh, and maintain the loyalty of all people through theological compromise. Um, and this ultimately didn't work because the divisions were more than just theological. Uh, again, they had you know, the ethnic issues going on, they had the uh, government issues going on, and so it was hard for the emperor to try and maintain uh, unity through theological compromise because there were other things in play. Uh, so really what happened was that uh, there was further alienation uh, between those who supported the decision at Chalcedon and those who didn't. Um, and so this kind of comes to a head with em Emperor Zeno. So Emperor Zeno, he ruled from 474 to 475 and 476 to 491. Uh, and it comes to a head with him by issuing an Edict of Union in 482. So what happened was that Zeno had been uh, had uh, been disposed by a guy, excuse me, not disposed, but deposed uh, by, a game by a guy named Basilicus. So Basilicus decided that the decision made at Chalcedon should be undone, um, and so he annulled that decision and called for a new council. Uh, that council never met, though, because Zeno was able to regain the throne and thus issue his Edict of Union. So the edict essentially said that everyone should believe what they believed before the Council of Chalcedon. Um, and this really ruffled the feathers of Pope Felix III in Rome because he didn't think the emperor had any right to tell people or the church what to believe. Uh, Father Acacius sided with Zeno, thus creating this schism of Acacius. And so uh, Cassius was uh, in Constantinople. So remember, uh, when the uh, capital of the empire moved from Rome to Constantinople, I told you there would be uh, you know, lingering effects on the church for this. So the father uh, was in uh, Constantinople, and the pope was in Rome. And so the father in Constantinople uh, sided with Zeno, and it created the schism. Um, and what it was, was really an open breach between the bishops of Rome and the bishops of Constantinople. And this schism lasted until 519 when Emperor Justin and Pope Hormizdus agreed uh, to the decision at Chalcedon. And so, you know, I, I know I'm throwing out uh, you know, a bunch of different names uh, at you, and, and it's really just uh, when you're looking at such a time period, there's so much going on, so many, so many people involved, so many decisions being made. It's, it can be kind of hard to keep up. Um, but just, again, by uh, way of reminder and recap, that we're kind of looking at life after the Council of Chalcedon in 451. And so we get this, um, you know, emperors are trying to maintain uh, loyalty and stability in the eastern part of the empire, um, but they're, and they're trying to do that through theological compromise. Um, the issue is, though, that those, um, the problems in the eastern part of the empire do extend beyond just theological differences. Um, taxation, racial, you know, those kinds of different things. But um, and now we're kind of honing in, focusing in on what were some of the theological issues taking place that contributed to this turmoil in the empire. And so... Um, you know, Emperor Zeno, you know, issued that edict, and uh, the Pope in Rome did not like that because he didn't think an emperor should tell the people or the church what to believe. And so there's a schism between the leader of the church in Constantinople and the leader of the church in Rome. <coughs> and that lasted again until 519 when Emperor Justin and Pope Armistice uh, agreed on the council at Chalcedon. So, kind of fast forward a couple of years, we get to Emperor Justinian. Uh, Emperor Justinian succeeded Emperor Justin, um, and his actions led to the Fifth Ecumenical Council in 553. This is also known as the Second Council of Constantinople. 
So Justinian tried to regain the allegiance of the anti-Chalcedonians by condemning the writings of three Antiochian theologians. Excuse me. Justinian didn't condemn the Council of Chalcedon, just three theologians that people who didn't agree with the council didn't like. Okay, so uh, to kind of explain that. So the emperor, so, um, so at the Council of Chalcedon, they uh, there are of course you know are supporters of that decision, and so uh, what Emperor Justinian did was he condemned uh, three theologians who uh, supported the decision at Chalcedon, but who the anti-Chalcedonians did not like. So um, those condemned were Theodore of Mospusitia, Theodore of Cyrus, and Ibis of Edda excuse me, Ibis of Edessa to Maris. And so uh, those who refused to condemn them were labeled as Nestorians. Um, and this controversy led Justinian to call the Fifth Ecumenical Council, and there they condemned the three chapters of teachings of Nestorius and also reaffirmed the previous councils. Um, but this really did little to satisfy those who wanted the decision of Chalcedon to be withdrawn. And so in the 7th century, uh, we get the 6th Ecumenical Council. Uh, this is also known as the 3rd Council of Constantinople. And what led up to this was that the patriarch, or the father of Constantinople, Father Sergius, said that there were two natures in Christ, but only one will. Uh, and it seems he was arguing that the divine will replaced the human will. So those who heard this raised the same objections that they did against Apollinaris. If Jesus didn't have a human will, then he wasn't fully human. So this became the belief monothelitism. Mono meaning one, and thelma meaning will. So Pope Honorus, uh, who was Pope from 625 to 638 of Rome, agreed with him. And so there were debates about this matter until 648, when Emperor Constans II prohibited discussion of Christ and his will or wills. And so uh, later in 681, we get the Sixth Ecumenical Council, where they declare Honorius to be a heretic, and they also condemned monothelitism. And so uh, <clears throat> Pope Agatho of Rome uh, proved uh, to be influential as he sent a letter to the council saying that it is the, tradition, the traditional belief of the church uh, that there are two wills in Christ. So those at the council saw it as Peter speaking through the Pope, and those accept what he had to say. So at this council, they condemned anyone who supported monothelitism, and that includes Honorius of Rome. So at a council, um, a former Pope was condemned to be a heretic. So I want to pause and kind of break down this Sixth Ecumenical Council for a moment and help uh, give you a better understanding of what was going on, what was taking place. So again, we have these uh, uh, this pope in Constantinople and this pope in um, Rome. And um, what was going on is that the leader of the church in Constantinople said that there were two natures in Christ, but only one will. And people who heard that said, no, that sounds like Apollinaris, remember from several lectures ago. Uh, and they were saying that if Jesus didn't have a human will, then he wasn't fully human. And so uh, this turned into the belief of monothelitism, uh, meaning one will. And so uh, Pope Honorius of Rome agreed with him. And so later on what happens is the council of uh, this sixth ecumenical council ends up condemning that pope which, you know, in terms of viewing, you know, Catholic teaching today on um, the infallibility of a pope, uh, you know, on his teaching while he's the pope, I mean, a, a church council has condemned a pope as a heretic before uh, based on this teaching. And so um, that that's, you know, pretty mind-boggling when you stop and think about that, that 
though the Roman Catholic Church has this belief that um, the Pope is infallible in terms of uh, teaching and doctrine while he's the Pope, yet here was a Pope that was condemned um, in 681 uh, because he did not, um, because he believed uh, a heretical teaching and, and propagated it. And so uh, the Pope that kind of came to save the day in that regard was Pope Agatho. And uh, you know, he wrote a letter to the council saying, you know, this is the traditional belief of the uh, church, that there's two wills in Christ. And at that meeting, uh, people saw, uh, people kind of viewed uh, this pope with such awe and regard that they saw it as, you know, Peter speaking through the pope and thus accepted what he had to say. So the council accepted what uh, Pope Agatho uh, was uh, writing about uh, because they saw Peter as speaking through him. And so then the last council that we have that all you know, Christians generally agree on is the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which occurred in 787. And so this purpose of this council was to settle the issue of iconoclasm. So iconoclasm was about what to do with images or icons, and should they be worshipped. That was the whole issue related to iconoclasm. It dealt with the question of what deserves worship or veneration. And so, um, you know, I'm curious, you know, as to your thoughts, you know, are there, is there anything that deserves worship or veneration, from images of saints to the Bible or the cross, those kinds of things? And, um, you know, it, it's not a bad thing to revere some of those things, and we're going to talk about that here in a moment. And so, in short, the Seventh Ecumenical Council restored the veneration of icons. So, what was happening during this time is that in the sixth, the sixth century, excuse me, uh, the government uh, and church was encouraging people to honor holy men and to make icons or images. So while in the early church there was precedence for this, over time there was concern that the church was leading people to idolatry as ordinary believers uh, began to confine their worship to shrines or figures. So there was concern about the misuse of objects and worship, uh, which someone, uh, you know, which uh, some of you have read, should have read in your life and practice uh, report. So this iconoclasm issue wasn't entirely new to the church. Uh, the church and empire had been dealing with this for some time. Um, examples of icons, you know, included Justinian putting a statue of Christ over the gate to his palace. Um, eventually, Christ's icon made it on the back of coins. Uh, Emperor Leo III began to put an end to this practice of using icons. And several other Byzantine emperors uh, decide to follow suit. So the reason for this shift isn't entirely clear though. Uh, some attribute it to the rise and influence of Islam where they were against physical representation or it could be that the emperors realized that Israel was punished because of idolatry and so they didn't want to lead the empire in that. So wanting to avoid that punishment uh, he began to put an end to the use of images in worship. Leo III did so. This uh, was not well received. So those who wanted to destroy images were called iconoclasts, and those who thought it was okay to worship them were called iconoduals. So like I said, it was not received well. Leo wanted to replace the image of Christ over top of the gate with that of a cross. But the official who uh, was supposed to do that was murdered because they did not agree with that. They did not want that to happen. Uh, iconoclasts ripped out mosaics from walls, others were whitewashed, etc. So what the iconoclasts wanted to do was replace the images with traditional symbols like cross, like a cross or a Bible. Um, the iconoduals thought that this movement was going against orthodoxy itself, this movement of getting rid of images. So they wondered how one could question a representation of Jesus as he was truly human and God was visible in him. 
Also, God created humans after a divine image. So how could it be wrong? How could it be wrong to have an image? So uh, during this time, one of the greatest theologians was John of Damascus. And he helped provide some middle ground, some middle ground between those who said no images at all and middle ground between those who said um, yes, images all the time of everything. And so he offers some good insight here. He says this, It is disastrous to suppose that the church does not know God as he is, that she degenerates into idolatry. For if she declines from perfection in a single iota, it is an enduring mark on a comely face. You see, the one thing to be aimed at is not to adore a created thing more than the creator, nor to give worship of latria, that is worship in a strict sense, except to him alone. By worship, consequently, he, that is God, always understands the worship of latria. These injunctions were given to the Jews on account of the, uh, excuse me, on account of the proneness to idolatry. We have passed the stage of infancy and related the perfection of manhood. When he who is when he who is a pure spirit without form or limit, existing as God, takes the form of a servant in substance and nature, then you may draw his likeness and show it to him to anyone willing to contemplate it. Worship is not all of the same kind. The worship of Latria is one thing, and the worship which is given to Mara another. Do not despise uh, matter, for it is not despicable. What a book is to the literate, that an image is to the illiterate. You who refuse to worship images should not worship the Son of God, the living image of the invisible God, and his unchanging form. Honoring the image leads to honoring the prototype. He also says, to depict God in shape would be the peak of madness and impiety. But since God became truly man, the Father, seeing that not all can read or have the time for it, approved the descriptions of these facts and images that they might serve as brief commentaries. And so it is with John's wisdom in mind that the council met in 787, led by Patriarch Tarsius of Constantinople. Uh, and they made the same distinction that he did, that there's a distinction between worship in the strict sense and, <clears throat> excuse me, worship in the strict sense and then a lesser form of worship. So uh, the words you know, kind of used to describe was latria, worship in the strict sense, or doula, worship in a lesser form, that were veneration. And so uh, we may see this with the Bible. Uh, growing up, my mom taught me never put a Bible on the floor, never say anything on top of a Bible. Now, I don't worship the Bible in a strict sense, but I do uh, venerate it. I do uh, treat it special. I do have a uh, regard for it. And so I think probably many of us, uh, maybe in the South, uh, had some kind of uh, upbringing similar to that if you were raised in the church that you treat certain objects uh, special. And so that's kind of what it was kind of boiling down to. You know, what do you worship and what do you revere or venerate? And so the impact that John had was that he was able, is that he made it acceptable to have icons of the apostles, angels, Marys, and other saints. Um, by highlighting, you know, the purpose wasn't to worship them in a strict sense, but to approach them with reverence and respect. Uh, the image should point us to the truth of the image, and you should contemplate the truth. So, you know, Bible story images, pictures, paintings, those kinds of things. You know, I really like what he said, that uh, what a book is to the literate, so is images to the illiterate. That is how people read, is through those images. And so, um, uh, again, you know, what was kind of taking place is that the church had historically condoned um, this veneration of images, um, but then there was a movement, again, not exactly clear why, not sure if it was the effect of Islam or, you know, fear the church might go into idolatry as Israel did, uh, but there was a movement away from it, and everything that was happening in the, as a result of this movement away from it led to this Seventh Ecumenical Council, where they affirmed that, it's, it, that it is okay to worship images, but worship only in a doula sense, not in a latria sense. And so uh, that wraps up our lecture for today. Um, 
just kind of a quick summation of uh, the 5th, 6th, and 7th Ecumenical Councils. Looking forward to reading your discussion post. If you have any questions, please let me know. Blessings to you all.